Chapter Twenty Three of Nurse and Spy in the Union Army by Sarah Emma E. Edmonds. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Three. After reaching Warrenton, the army encamped in that vicinity for a few days, during which Father Abraham took the favorable opportunity of relieving the idol of the Army of the Potomac from his command and ordered him to report at Trenton, New Jersey, just as he was entering upon another campaign with his army in splendid condition. After a brief address and an affecting farewell to officers and men, he hastened to comply with the order. His farewell address was as follows, quote, November 7, 1862. Officers and Soldiers of the Army of the Potomac. An order of the President devolves upon Major General Burnside the command of this army. In parting from you, I cannot express the love and gratitude I bear you. As an army, you have grown up under my care. In you I have never found doubt or coldness. The battles you have fought under my command will proudly live in our nation's history. The glory you have achieved, our mutual perils and fatigues, the graves of our comrades fallen in battle and by disease, the broken forms of those whom wounds and sickness have disabled, the strongest associations which can exist among men, unite us still by an indissoluble tie. We shall ever be comrades in supporting the constitution of our country and the nationality of its people. End quote. That was a sad day for the Army of the Potomac. The new commander marched the army immediately to Falmouth, opposite Fredericksburg. Of the incidents of that march I know nothing, for I went to Washington, and from thence to Aquia Creek by water. I did not return to Washington on the cars, but rode on horseback, and made a two days trip of it, visiting all the old places as I went. The battleground of the first and second Bull Run battles, Centerville, Fairfax Courthouse, and Chantilla but how shall I describe the sights which I saw and the impressions which I had as I rode over those fields? There were men and horses thrown together in heaps, and some clay thrown on them above ground. Others lay where they had fallen, their limbs bleaching in the sun without the appearance of burial. There was one in particular, a cavalryman. He and his horse both lay together, nothing but the bones and clothing remained but one of his arms stood straight up, or rather the bones and the coat sleeve, his hand had dropped off at the wrist and lay on the ground. Not a finger or joint was separated, but the hand was perfect. I dismounted twice for the purpose of bringing away that hand, but did not do so after all. I would have done so if it had been possible to find a clue to his name or regiment." The few families who still live in that vicinity tell horrid tales of the brutal conduct of the rebels after those battles. A southern clergyman declares that in the town where he now resides he saw rebel soldiers selling Yankee skulls at ten dollars apiece, and it is a common thing to see rebel women bear rings and ornaments made of our soldiers' bones. In fact, they boast of it, even to the Union soldiers, that they have Yankee bone ornaments. This to me is a far more sickening sight than was presented at the time of the battles, with dead and wounded lying in their gore. I looked in vain for the old brush heap which had once screened me from the rebel cavalry. The fire had consumed it. But the remains of the stone church at Centerville was an object of deep interest to me. I went from Washington to Aquia Creek by steamer, and from thence to Falmouth on horseback. I found the army encamped in the mud for miles along the Rappahannock River. The river is very narrow between Falmouth and Fredericksburg, not more than a stone's cast in some places. I have often seen the pickets on both sides amusing themselves by throwing stones across it. Some writer, in describing the picturesque scenery in this locality, says, quote, There is a young river meandering through its center, towards which slope down beautiful banks of mud on either side, while the fields are delightfully variegated by alternate patches of snow and swamp, and the numerous roads are in such condition that no matter which one you take, you are sure to wish you had tried another instead. 
all the mud and bad roads on the peninsula could not bear the least comparison with that of Falmouth and along the Rappahannock. It was now December, and the weather was extremely cold, yet the constant rains kept the roads in the most terrible state imaginable. On riding along the brink of the river, we could see distinctly the rebel batteries frowning on the heights beyond the city of Fredericksburg, and the rebel sentinels walking their rounds within talking distance of our own pickets. On the 11th the city was shelled by our troops. The pontoon bridges were laid amid showers of bullets from the sharpshooters of the enemy, who were ensconced in the houses on the opposite bank. However, the work went steadily on, notwithstanding that two out of every three who were engaged in laying the bridges were either killed or wounded but as fast as one fell another took his place soon it was deemed expedient to take care of those sharpshooters before the bridges could be finished several companies filed into boats and rowed across in a few minutes the men of the seventh michigan leading the van and drove the rebels from the houses killing some and taking many prisoners the bridges were soon completed the troops marched over and took possession of the city headquarters were established in the principal building and a church and other large buildings were appropriated for hospital purposes the following is an extract from my journal written on the battlefield the second day after we crossed the river Quote, battlefield fredericksburg virginia december thirteenth eighteen sixty two in consequence of one of general h s staff officers being ill i have volunteered to take his place and am now aide-de-camp to General H. I wish my friends could see me in my present uniform. This division will probably charge on the enemy's works this afternoon. God grant them success. While I write, the roar of cannon and musketry is almost deafening, and the shot and shell are falling fast on all sides. This may be my last entry in this journal. God's will be done. I commit myself to him, soul and body." I must close. General H. has mounted his horse and says, Come. End quote. Of course, it is not for me to say whose fault it was in sacrificing those thousands of noble lives which fall upon that disastrous field, or in charging again and again upon those terrible stone walls and fortifications, after being repulsed every time with more than half their number lying on the ground. The brave men, nothing daunted by their thinned ranks, advanced more fiercely on the foe plunged in the battery's smoke fiercely the line they broke strong was the sabre stroke making an army reel but when it was proved to a demonstration that it was morally impossible to take and retain those heights in consequence of the natural advantage of position which the rebels occupied and still would occupy if they should fall back whose fault was it that the attempt was made time after time until the field was literally piled with dead and ran red with blood we may truly say of the brave soldiers thus sacrificed theirs is not to reason why theirs not to make reply theirs but to do and die among the many who fell in that dreadful battle perhaps there is none more worthy of notice than the brave and heroic major edward e sturdivant of keene new hampshire who fell while leading the gallant fifth in a charge upon the enemy he was the first man in new hampshire who enlisted for the war he was immediately authorized by the governor to make enlistments for the first new hampshire volunteers and was eminently successful he held the commission of captain in the first regiment and afterwards was promoted major of the fifth one of the leading papers of his native state has the following with regard to him quote, he was in every battle where the regiment was engaged, nine or ten in number, besides skirmishes, and was slightly wounded at the Battle of Fair Oaks. He commanded the regiment most of the time on the retreat from the Chickahominy to James River. The filial affection of the deceased was of the strongest character, and made manifest in substantial ways on many occasions. His death is the first in the household, and deep is the grief that is experienced there but that grief will doubtless be mitigated by the consoling circumstance that the departed son and brother died in a service that will hallow his memory for ever. 
a braver man or more faithful friend never yielded up his spirit amidst the clash of arms and the wail of the dying. End quote. I well remember the desperate charge which that brave officer made upon the enemy just before he fell, and the thinned and bleeding ranks of his men as they returned, leaving their beloved commander on the field, reminded me of the gallant six hundred, of whom Tennyson has written the following lines. Stormed at with shot and shell, they that had struck so well rode through the jaws of death, half a league back again, up, from the mouth of hell, all that was left of them. I have since had the pleasure of becoming acquainted with the bereaved family of the deceased, and deeply sympathize with them in the loss of one so noble, kind, and brave. Major Sturdevant was the son of George W. Sturdevant, Esquire, and nephew of Rev. David Kilburn, one of the pioneers of Methodism, whom thousands will remember as a faithful and efficient minister of the gospel. During the progress of that battle I saw many strange sights, although I had been in many a fierce battle before. I never saw, till then, a man deliberately shoot himself with his own pistol in order to save the rebels the satisfaction of doing so, as it would seem. As one brigade was ordered into line of battle, I saw an officer take out his pistol and shoot himself through the side, not mortally, I am sorry to say, but just sufficient to unfit him for duty. So he was carried to the rear, he protesting that it was done by accident. Another officer I saw there, a young and handsome lieutenant, disgrace his shoulder straps by showing the white feather at the very moment when he was most needed. I rode three miles with General H. to General Franklin's headquarters, the second night we were at Fredericksburg, and of all the nights I can recall to mind, that was the darkest. On our way we had numerous ditches to leap, various ravines to cross, and mountains to climb, which can be better imagined than described. It was not only once or twice that horse and rider went tumbling into Chasm's head first, but frequently. As we passed along, we stopped at the headquarters of General Bayard, General of Cavalry, a few minutes, found him enjoying a cup of coffee under a large tree, which constituted his headquarters. We called again when we returned, but he was cold in death, having been struck by a stray shot, and died in a short time. He was killed just where we had left him, under the tree. He was a splendid officer, and his removal was a great loss to the Federal cause. His death cast a gloom over his whole command, which was deeply felt. Of the wounded of this battle I can say but little, for my time was fully occupied in the responsible duties which I had volunteered to perform, and so constantly was I employed that I was not out of the saddle but once in twelve hours, and that was to assist an officer of the seventy-ninth who lay writhing in agony on the field, having been seized with cramps and spasms, and was suffering the most extreme pain. He was one of the brave and fearless ones, however, and in less than an hour, after having taken some powerful medicine which I procured for him, he was again on his horse at the general's side. On going to the church hospital in search of Dr. E., I saw an immense shell which had been sent through the building and fell on the floor, in the centre of those wounded and dying men who had just been carried off the field, and placed there for safety. But, strange to say, it did not burst or injure any one, and was carried out and laid beside the mangled limbs which had been amputated in consequence of contact with just such instruments of death. I saw the remains of the Rev. A. B. Fuller, chaplain of the 16th Massachusetts, as they were removed to the camp. He was faithful to his trust, and died at his post. On one of my necessary rides, in the darkness of that dreadful night, I passed by a graveyard near by where our reserves were lying, and there, in that hour of darkness and danger, I heard the voice of prayer ascend. A group of soldiers were there holding communion with God, strengthening their souls for the coming conflict. There are, scattered over the battlefields and camping grounds of this war, Bethels, consecrated to God, and sacred to souls who have wrestled and prevailed. This retirement was a graveyard with a marble slab for an altar, 
where that little band met to worship God, perhaps for the last time. But among all the dead and wounded, I saw none who touched my heart so much as one beautiful boy, severely wounded. He was scarcely more than a child, and certainly a very attractive one. Some one writes the following, after he was sent to a hospital. Quote, among the many brave, uncomplaining fellows who were brought up to the hospital from the Battle of Fredericksburg was a bright-eyed and intelligent youth, sixteen years old, who belonged to a northern regiment. He appeared more affectionate and tender, more refined and thoughtful than many of his comrades, and attracted a good deal of attention from the attendants and visitors. Manifestly the pet of some household which he had left perhaps in spite of entreaty and tears he expressed an anxious longing for the arrival of his mother who was expected having been informed that he was mortally wounded and failing fast ere she arrived however he died but before the end almost his last act of consciousness was the thought that she had really come for as a lady sat by his pillow and wiped the death dews from his brow just as his sight was failing he rallied a little like an expiring taper in its socket, looked up longingly and joyfully, and in tones that drew tears from every eye, whispered audibly, Is that mother? Then drawing her toward him with all his feeble power, he nestled his head in her arms like a sleeping child, and thus died with the sweet word mother on his lips. End quote. Raise me in your arms, dear mother, let me once more look, on the green and waving willows and the flowing brook hark those strains of angel music from the choirs above dearest mother i am going truly god is love a council of war was held by our generals and the conclusion arrived at that the enterprise should be abandoned and that the army should recross the rappahannock under cover of darkness everything was conducted in the most quiet manner so quiet, indeed, that the enemy never suspected the movement, and the retreat was accomplished, and the bridges partially removed, before the fact was discovered. End of chapter 23「twenty four of Nurse and Spy in the Union Army by Sarah Emma E. Edmonds. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Four. After the Battle of Fredericksburg, the weather was very cold, and the wounded suffered exceedingly, even after they were sent to Aquia Creek and other places, for they could not all be provided for and made comfortable immediately. Our troops returned to their old camps in the mud and remained stationary for several weeks, notwithstanding our daily orders were to be ready to march at a moment's notice. The unnecessary slaughter of our men at Fredericksburg had a sad effect upon our troops, and the tone of the northern press was truly distressing. The wailing for the noble dead seemed wafted on every breeze, for, in the city, in the village, in the hamlet far away, sit the mothers, watching, waiting, for their soldier boys to-day. They are coming, daily coming, one by one and score by score, in their leaden casings folded, underneath the flag they bore. On the 20th of January, General Burnside issued the following order to the army, which was joyfully received, for of all places for an encampment, that seemed to be the most inconvenient and disagreeable. Headquarters, Army of the Potomac, Camp near Falmouth, Virginia, January 20, 1863. General Orders No. 7. The commanding general announces to the Army of the Potomac that they are about to meet the enemy once more. The late brilliant actions in North Carolina, Tennessee, and Arkansas have divided and weakened the enemy on the Rappahannock, and the auspicious moment seems to have arrived to strike a great and mortal blow to the rebellion, and to gain that decisive victory which is due to the country. Let the gallant soldiers of so many brilliant battlefields accomplish this achievement, and a fame the most glorious awaits them. The commanding general calls for the firm and united action of officers and men, and, under the providence of God, the Army of the Potomac will have taken the great step towards restoring peace to the country, and the government to its rightful authority. 
by command of Major General Burnside, Lewis Richmond, Assistant Adjutant General. Soon after this order was issued, a portion of the army did really move, but the pontoons became stuck in the mud, and the troops returned again. In this manner the winter wore away, and a severe winter I thought it was, for in riding a distance of two miles, in two instances, I had my feet frozen. General Hooker was now put in command of the Army of the Potomac, and Burnside, with the Ninth Army Corps, ordered to the Western Department. Being desirous of leaving the Army of the Potomac, I now applied for permission to go with the Ninth Corps, which was granted. I did not go with the troops, however, but went to Washington first, and remained several days, then took the cars and proceeded to Louisville, Kentucky, and arrived there before the troops did. The last entry in my journal, before leaving the Army of the Potomac, was as follows, quote, The Weather Department is in perfect keeping with the War Department, its policy being to make as many changes as possible, and every one worse than the last. May God bless the old Army of the Potomac, and save it from total annihilation. End quote. On the arrival of the troops at Louisville, they were sent in detachments to different places, some to Bardstown, some to Lebanon, and others to guard different portions of the railroad. The third day after my arrival, I went out with a reconnoitering expedition under command of General M. It was entirely composed of cavalry. We rode thirty-six miles that afternoon. The roads were splendid. When we were about twelve miles from our lines, we changed our course and struck through the woods, fording creeks and crossing swamps, which was anything but pleasant. After emerging from the thick undergrowth, on one occasion, we came upon an inferior force of the enemy's cavalry. A sharp skirmish ensued, which resulted in the capture of five prisoners from the rebel band, and wounding several. Three of our men were slightly wounded, but we returned to Louisville in good order, and enjoyed the luxury of a good supper at a hotel, which is a rare thing in that city. I took the cars the next day and went to Lebanon, dressed in one of the rebel prisoners' clothes, and thus disguised made another trip to rebeldom. My business purported to be buying up butter and eggs at the farmhouses for the rebel army. I passed through the line somewhere without knowing it, for on coming to a little village toward evening I found it occupied by a strong force of rebel cavalry. The first house I went to was filled with officers and citizens. I had stumbled upon a wedding party unawares. Captain Logan, a recruiting officer, had been married that afternoon to a brilliant young widow whose husband had been killed in the rebel army a few months before. She had discovered that widow's weeds were not becoming to her style of beauty, so had decided to appear once more in bridal costume for a change. I was questioned pretty sharply by a handsome captain in regard to the nature of my business in that locality, but finding me an innocent, straightforward Kentuckian, he came to the conclusion that I was all right. But he also arrived at the conclusion that I was old enough to be in the army, and bantered me considerably upon my want of patriotism. The rebel soldier's clothes which I wore did not indicate anything more than that I was a Kentuckian, for their cavalry do not dress in any particular uniform, for scarcely two of them dress alike, the only uniformity being that they most generally dress in butternut color. I tried to make my escape from that village as soon as possible, but just as I was beginning to congratulate myself upon my good fortune, who should confront me but Captain Logan? Said he, See here, my lad, I think the best thing you can do is to enlist, and join a company which is just forming here in the village, and will leave in the morning. We are giving a bounty to all who freely enlist, and are conscripting those who refuse. Which do you propose to do, enlist and get in the bounty, or refuse, and be obliged to go without anything? I replied, I think I shall wait a few days before I decide. But we can't wait for you to decide, said the captain. The Yankees may be upon us any moment, for we are not far from their lines, and we will leave here either to-night or in the morning early. I will give you two hours to decide this question, and in the meantime you must be put under guard. 
So saying, he marched me back with him and gave me in charge of the guards. In two or three hours he came for my decision, and I told him that I had concluded to wait until I was conscripted. Well, said he, you will not have long to wait for that, so you may consider yourself a soldier of the Confederacy from this hour, and subject to military discipline. This seemed to me like a pretty serious business, especially as I would be required to take the oath of allegiance to the Confederate government. However, I did not despair, but trusted in Providence and my own ingenuity to escape from this dilemma also and as I was not required to take the oath until the company was filled up, I was determined to be among the missing ere it became necessary for me to make any professions of loyalty to the rebel cause. I knew that if I should refuse to be sworn into the service after I was conscripted, that in all probability my true character would be suspected, and I would have to suffer the penalty of death, and that too in the most barbarous manner." I was glad to find that it was a company of cavalry that was being organized, for if I could once get on a good horse there would be some hope of my escape. There was no time to be lost, as the captain remarked, for the Yankees might make a dash upon us at any moment. Consequently a horse and saddle was furnished me, and everything was made ready for a start immediately. Ten o'clock came, and we had not yet started. The captain finally concluded that, as everything seemed quiet, we would not start until daylight. Music and dancing was kept up all night, and it was some time after daylight when the captain made his appearance. A few moments more, and we were trotting briskly over the country, the captain complimenting me upon my horsemanship, and telling me how grateful I would be to him when the war was over and the South had gained her independence, and that I would be proud that I had been one of the soldiers of the Southern Confederacy, who had steeped my saber in Yankee blood, and driven the vandals from our soil. Then, said he, you will thank me for the interest which I have taken in you, and for the gentle persuasives which I made use of to stir up your patriotism, and remind you of your duty to your country. In this manner we had travelled about half an hour, when we suddenly encountered a reconnoitering party of the Federals, cavalry in advance, and infantry in the rear. A contest soon commenced. We were ordered to advance in line, which we did, until we came within a few yards of the Yankees. The company advanced, but my horse suddenly became unmanageable, and it required a second or two to bring him right again, and before I could overtake the company and get in line, the contending parties had met in a hand-to-hand -hand fight. All were engaged, so that when I, by accident, got on the Federal side of the line, none observed me for several minutes, except the Federal officer, who had recognized me and signaled to me to fall in next to him. That brought me face to face with my rebel captain, to whom I owed such a debt of gratitude. Thinking this would be a good time to cancel all obligations in that direction, I discharged the contents of my pistol in his face. This act made me the centre of attention. Every rebel seemed determined to have the pleasure of killing me first, and a simultaneous dash was made toward me and numerous sabre-strokes aimed at my head. Our men with one accord rushed between me and the enemy, and warded off the blows with their sabres, and attacked them with such fury that they were driven back several rods. The infantry now came up and deployed as skirmishers, and succeeded in getting a position where they had a complete cross-fire on the rebels, and poured in volley after volley until nearly half their number lay upon the ground. Finding it useless to fight longer at such a disadvantage, they turned and fled, leaving behind them eleven killed, twenty-nine wounded, and seventeen prisoners. The Confederate captain was wounded badly, but not mortally. His handsome face was very much disfigured, a part of his nose and nearly half of his upper lip being shot away. I was sorry, for the graceful curve of his moustache was sadly spoiled, and the happy bride of the previous morning would no longer rejoice in the beauty of that manly face and exquisite moustache of which she seemed so proud, and which had captivated her heart ere she had been three months a widow. Our men suffered considerable loss before the infantry came up, but afterward scarcely lost a man. 
I escaped without receiving a scratch, but my horse was badly cut across the neck with a sabre, but which did not injure him materially, only for a short time. After burying the dead, Federal and Rebel, we returned to camp with our prisoners and wounded, and I rejoiced at having once more escaped from the Confederate lines. I was highly commended by the commanding general for my coolness throughout the whole affair, and was told kindly and candidly that I would not be permitted to go out again in that vicinity, in the capacity of spy, as I would most assuredly meet with some of those who had seen me desert their ranks, and I would consequently be hung up to the nearest tree. Not having any particular fancy for such an exalted position, and not at all ambitious of having my name handed down to posterity among the list of those who expiated their crimes upon the gallows, I turned my attention to more quiet and less dangerous duties. Then sweet thoughts of home came stealing over my mind, and I exclaimed, Adieu, dear land, with beauty teeming, where first I roved a careless child, of thee my heart will e'er be dreaming, thy snow-clad peaks and mountains wild. Dear land that I cherish, O oh, long mayst thou flourish, my memory must perish, ere I forget thee. End of chapter 24「Chapter Twenty Five of Nurse and Spy in the Union Army by Sarah Emma E. Edmonds. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Five Being prohibited from further explorations in that region outside of our lines, I was appointed to act as detective inside of the lines, as there were many spies in our midst who were daily giving information to the enemy and had baffled all attempts at discovery. I forthwith dressed in citizens' clothes and proceeded to Louisville, and there mingled freely with the citizens, visited the different places of public resort, and made many secesh acquaintances. At length I found a merchant, who was the most bitter in his denunciations of the Yankees that it has ever been my lot to meet, and I thought he would be a pretty good person to assist me in my undertakings." Stepping into his store one morning, I inquired if he was in need of a clerk. He replied that he would require help in a few days, as one of his clerks was going to leave. Then came the interrogatory process. Who was I, where did I come from, and what had brought me to that city? Well, I was a foreigner, and wishing to see a little of this great American war, I had come down south and now that I was here, finding myself scarce of money, I would like to find some employment. This was literally true. I was a foreigner, and very often scarce of money, and really wished him to employ me. He finally told me that I might come in the course of a week, but that did not suit my purpose, so I told him I would rather come at once, as I would be learning considerable before the other clerk went away adding that he might give me just whatever he pleased for the first week's work. This seemed to suit him, and I was at once set to work. After I had been there several days, I was asked how I would like to go out to the nearest camp and sell some small articles to the soldiers. I would like it much, so was sent accordingly with an assortment of pocket knives, combs, and suspenders. By the middle of the afternoon I had sold out my stock in trade, returned to the store, and gave a good account of myself and of the goods entrusted to my care. My employer was pleased with my success, and seemed interested in me, and each day brought some new proof of his confidence. Things went on in this way for two weeks, in which time I had succeeded, by the good merchant's assistance, in finding a clue to three rebel spies then within our lines. I was often questioned by my employer with regard to my political sentiments, but of course I did not know anything about politics. In fact, I hardly knew how to apply the terms federal and confederate, and often misapplied them when talking in the store, and was frequently told that I must not call the didn't Yankees confederates, and all due pains were taken to instruct me and give me a proper insight into the true state of affairs as seen by southern secessionists. At last I expressed a desire to enter the Confederate service, 
and asked the merchant how I should manage to get through the Yankee lines if I should decide to take such a step. After a long conversation and much planning, we at last decided that I should go through our lines the next night with a person who was considered by our troops a thorough Union man, as he had taken the oath of allegiance to the federal government, but who was in reality a rebel spy. That afternoon I was sent out again to dispose of some goods to the soldiers, and while I was gone took the favorable opportunity of informing the provost marshal of my intended escape the following night together with my brother spy. After telling him that I might not be able to leave the store again with any more definite information without incurring suspicion, and that he had better send someone to the store at a certain hour the next day to purchase some trifle, so that I might enclose in the parcel the necessary information, I went back to the store, and my clever employer told me that I had better not trouble myself any more about anything, but get ready for my journey. Having but little preparation to make, however, I soon returned to the store. Not long after, a gentleman came in, to whom I was introduced, and was told that this was the person who proposed to conduct me through the lines. He was not announced in his true character, but I understood at once that this gentlemanly personage was no less than the spy before referred to. He questioned me pretty sharply, but I being slow of speech, referred him to the merchant, whose eloquence had convinced me of my duty to the Southern Confederacy. My employer stood beside me and gave him a brief history of our acquaintance and of his confidence in me also of his own peculiar faculty of impressing the truth upon unprejudiced minds. The spy evidently took me for a poor green boy whom the merchant had flattered into the idea of becoming a soldier, but who did not realize the responsibility of my position, and I confirmed him in that opinion by saying, Well, I suppose if I don't like soldiering they will let me go home again? The provost marshal himself came in during the day, and I had my document ready, informing him what time we would start, and what direction we were to take. The night came, and we started about nine o'clock. As we walked along toward the rebel lines, the spy seemed to think that I was a true patriot in the rebel cause, for he entertained me with a long conversation concerning his exploits in the secret service, and of the other two who were still in camp, he said one of them was a sutler, and the other sold photographs of our generals. We were pursuing our way in the darkness, talking in a low, confidential tone, when suddenly a number of cavalry dashed upon us and took us both prisoners. As soon as we were captured, we were searched, and documents found on my companion which condemned him as a spy. We were then marched back to Louisville and put under guard. The next morning he was taken care of, and I was sent to General M.'s headquarters. The next thing to be done was to find the other two spies. The sutler was found and put under arrest, and his goods confiscated, but the dealer in photographs had made his escape. I never dared to go back to Louisville again, for I had ample reason to believe that my life would pay the penalty if I did. About this time the Ninth Army Corps was ordered to Vicksburg, where General Grant had already commenced his siege. While the troops waited at the depot for transportation, a little incident occurred which illustrates the spirit of the Kentucky soldiers on the slavery question. Two of our Kentucky regiments were stationed as guards at the depot, and on this occasion were amusing themselves by throwing stones at every poor negro who had occasion to pass within a stone's throw of them. A Michigan regiment marched into the depot on its way to Vicksburg, and along with it some smart, saucy darkies in the capacity of servants. The native soldiers began the same game with them by throwing stones at and abusing them. But the Michigan men informed them that, if they did not stop that kind of business immediately, they would find more work on hand than they could attend to, as they considered their servants a necessary part of their regiment, and would not permit them to be abused or insulted any more than if they were white men. This gave rise to a warm discussion between the troops, and ended in the Kentuckians forbidding and prohibiting the different regiments from taking a negro with them from the state under any circumstances. 
of course this incensed our patriotic troops, and in five minutes they were in line of battle, arrayed against their pro-slavery brethren in arms. But before blood was shed, the commander of the post was informed, and hastened to the spot to prevent further mischief. When the case was fully made known to him, he could not settle the matter, for he was a Kentuckian by birth, and his sympathies were with the native troops, yet he knew, if he should decide in their favor, that a bloody fight would be the consequence, as the troops still remained in line of battle, awaiting the decision of the commander. He finally told them that they must remain there until he telegraphed to the headquarters of the department, and received an answer. Consequently, the troops were detained two days, waiting for the dispatch that would decide the contest. The men became tired of the fun, and marched back to camp. In consequence of this affair, the poor negroes fared worse than ever, and the troops had no sooner gone back to camp than the Kentuckians swore they would hang every nigger that came into their camp. During the day I was passing through the depot, and saw a little black urchin selling cakes and pies, who had no sooner made his appearance than the guards took his basket away from him. The boy commenced to cry, when four of the soldiers took hold of him, each one taking hold of a hand or foot, and pulled him almost limb from limb, just as I have seen cruel schoolboys torture frogs. When they threw him on the ground, he could neither speak, cry, nor walk, but there he lay, a little quivering, convulsive heap of pain and misery. The telegram came at last, and the troops were permitted to depart in peace, taking with them their colored friends, to the chagrin of the Kentucky guards. Before reaching Vicksburg, I visited several hospitals where the wounded had been brought from those terrible battles preceding the siege of Vicksburg, where thousands lay with all conceivable sorts of wounds. Several I saw without either arms or legs, having been torn and mangled by shell so that it was impossible to save even a single limb, and yet they lived and would probably recover. One handsome man lay on one of the hospital boats who had lost both arms, a most noble specimen of the patient, cheerful, suffering soldier. Of this young man, the Reverend Mr. Savage writes, quote, There he lay upon his cot, armless, and knowing that this must be his condition through life, but yet with a cheerful, happy countenance, and not a single word of complaint. I ministered to his wants, and as I cut up fruit in mouthfuls and put them in his mouth, he would say, Well now, how good that is! How kind of you! The Lord will bless you for it! I don't see why you are so kind to me! As if any one could be too kind to a man who had suffered such a loss in defense of his country! his soul seemed to be resting peacefully upon Jesus amid all his great sufferings. One thing touched me exceedingly. As I spoke of his feelings, the tears coursed down his cheeks and lay upon them. He had no hands with which even to wipe away the tears from his own face. And as I took a handkerchief and tenderly performed this office, that beautiful passage of Scripture occurred to me with a force it never did before and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. End quote. Nearby lay another young man, an officer, mortally wounded, fast breathing his life away. He seemed unconscious of his dying state. I asked the nurse, in a low whisper, if he knew he was dying, but before the nurse could reply, he looked up with a smile and said, Yes, yes, I know it. Praise God. There is not a cloud between my soul and Jesus. I am waiting, I, waiting. These were his last words. A few moments more and his tongue was silent in death. But he's gone to rest in heaven above to sing his Saviour's praise. One of the military agents at Nashville relates a most thrilling incident, which he witnessed in a hospital at that place. He says, quote, Last evening, when passing by the post hospital, my attention was arrested by the singing, in rather a loud voice, of Rally Round the Flag Boys by one of the patients inside. While listening to the beautiful music of that popular song, I observed to a nurse standing in the doorway that the person singing must be in a very merry mood and could not be very sick. You are mistaken, sir, said he. 
the poor fellow engaged in singing that good old song is now grappling with death, has been dying all day. I am his nurse, he continued, and the scene so affected me that I was obliged to leave the room. He is just about breathing his last. I stepped into the ward, and true enough, the brave man was near his end. His eyes were already fixed in death. He was struggling with all his remaining strength against the grim monster, while at the same time there gushed forth from his patriotic soul incoherently the words, Rally round the flag, boys, which had so often cheered him through his weary march, and braced him up when entering the field of blood in defense of his country. Finally he sank away into his death slumber, and joined his maker's command, that is marching onward to that far-off better land. The last audible sound that escaped his lips was, Rally, boys, rally once again. As his eyes were closing, some dozen of his comrades joined in a solemn yet beautiful hymn appropriate to the occasion. Take it altogether, this was one of the most affecting scenes I have ever witnessed in a hospital. It drew tears copiously from near one hundred of us. It occurred in the large ward which occupies the entire body of the church on Cherry Street. The deceased was an Illinoisan, and had been wounded in one of the recent skirmishes. End quote. I noticed in the western department that the chaplains were much more faithful to their trust, and attentive to the sick and wounded, than the chaplains in the Army of the Potomac, taking them as a class. One man, in speaking of his chaplain, said, quote, He is one of the best men in the world. He has a temperance meeting once a week, a prayer meeting twice a week, and other meetings as he is able to hold them, and then he labors personally among the men. He also comforts the sick and dying. I saw him with one of our comrades before he died, watching and praying with him, and when he died he closed his eyes and prepared him for the grave with his own hands. Another said, quote, Over at Frederickstown, as our lines were beginning to give way, and many thought the day was lost, our chaplain stepped right out from the ranks between us and the enemy's lines, knelt down upon the ground, and lifted up his voice in most earnest prayer to God for divine help in that hour of need. I never felt so in all my life as I did at that moment. An inspiration, as from God, seemed to seize us all. We rallied, charged, drove the enemy before us, and gained the important victory at Frederickstown, which perhaps has saved to us the state of Mississippi. End quote. And yet another soldier gave testimony like the following, with regard to a chaplain who had followed his regiment through every battle in which it had participated. Said he, quote, He was with us day after day, and as soon as a man fell wounded, he would take him up in his arms and carry him out where the surgeon could take care of him and the last day I saw him, his clothes, from head to foot, were literally dripping with the blood of dead and wounded men that he had carried from the battlefield." This noble chaplain reminds me of a brave soldier in the Army of the Potomac, who was in the hottest of the Battle of Antietam, where the bullets were sweeping like death hail through the ranks. The line wavered, there were strong symptoms of falling back on the part of his regiment. This man rushed toward the color-bearer, who stood hesitating, seized the standard, and advanced with firm and rapid steps several paces in front of the foremost man. Then thrusting down the flagstaff into the ground, he looked up at the banner, then at the wavering line, and said, There, boys, come up to that. End of chapter 25「Chapter twenty six of Nurse and Spy in the Union Army by Sarah Emma E. Edmonds. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty six At one of the hospitals near Vicksburg, I met a man who had served a year in the Confederate Army, having been conscripted by the rebels, and remained that length of time before he found an opportunity to escape. He was an educated and highly intelligent young man and it was deeply interesting to listen to his account of the southern side of this rebellion. He told me that the southern people, and especially the ladies, were much more patriotic than the people of the north. 
after a battle the citizens both men and women come with one accord to assist in taking care of the wounded bringing with them gratuitously every article of comfort and convenience that their means will admit and their patriotism suggest farmers come to the hospitals with loads of provisions and the women come with fruits wines jellies etc and cheerfully submit to the hardships and fatigue of hospital labor without the slightest remuneration said he quote, the women down south are the best recruiting officers for they absolutely refuse to tolerate or admit to their society any young man who refuses to enlist and very often send their lovers who have not enlisted skirts and crinoline with a note attached suggesting the appropriateness of such a costume unless they donned the confederate uniform at once end quote. i have often thought of this trait of the southern lady's character and contrasted it with the flattering receptions so lavishly bestowed upon our able-bodied home guards by the new england fair ones who profess to love the old flag and despise its enemies and i have wondered if an extensive donation of crinoline would not be more effectual in filling up our ranks than graceful bows and bewitching smiles and i would mildly suggest that each package of crinoline be accompanied by the following appropriate lines now while our soldiers are fighting our battles each at his post to do all that he can down among rebels and contraband chattels what are you doing my sweet little man all the brave boys under canvas are sleeping all of them pressing to march with the van far from their homes where their sweethearts are weeping what are you waiting for sweet little man you with the terrible warlike moustaches fit for a colonel or chief of a clan you with the waist made for sword belts and sashes where are your shoulder straps sweet little man we send you the buttonless garments of woman cover your face lest it freckle or tan muster the apron string guards on the common that is the core for the sweet little man all the fair maidens about him shall cluster pluck the white feathers from bonnet and fan make him a plume like a turkey wing duster that is the crest for the sweet little man give him for escort a file of young misses each of them armed with a deadly rattan they shall defend him from laughter and hisses aimed by low boys at the sweet little man and now while i am contrasting the conduct of the north and south i may as well give another testimony in favor of the confederate system the following testimony comes from one who has served in the rebel army in the capacity of surgeon he says quote, the confederate military authorities have complete control of the press so that nothing is ever allowed to appear in print which can in any way give information to the north or prove a clue to southern movements in this it appears to me that they have an unspeakable advantage over the north with its numberless papers and hundreds of correspondents in the loyal army with what the correspondents tell and surmise and what the confederates find out through spies and informers of various kinds they are able to see through many of the plans of the union forces before they are put into execution no more common remark did i hear than this as officers were reading the northern papers see what didn't fools those yankees are general a has left b for c we will cut him off why the northern generals or the secretary of war tolerate this freedom of news we cannot imagine End quote. and he further adds quote, every daily paper i have read since i came north has contained information either by direct statement or implication by which the enemy can profit if we meant to play into the hands of the rebels we could hardly do it more successfully than our papers are doing it daily sure i am that if a southern paper contained such information of their movements as do the northern of ours the editor's neck would not be safe an hour but some will say we often see information quoted from the southern papers of their movements never until the movement has been carried out it is always safe to conclude if you see in a southern paper any statement with regard to the movement of troops or that the army is about to do a certain thing that it will not be done but something different end quote. 
freedom of opinion and of the press is certainly a precious boon but when it endangers the lives of our soldiers and frustrates the plans of our government surely it is time to adopt measures to control it just as much as it is necessary to arrest the spies who come within our lines another relates the following touching incident of the southern style of increasing their army and punishing offenders Quote, when the rebels were raising a force in eastern tennessee two brothers by the name of roland volunteered a younger brother was a union man and refusing to enlist was seized and forced into the army. He constantly protested against his impressment, but without avail. He then warned them that he would desert the first opportunity, as he would not fight against the cause of right and good government. They were inexorable, and he was torn from his family and hurried to the field. At the Battle of Fort Donaldson, Roland escaped from the rebels in the second day's fight, and immediately joined the loyal army though now to fight against his own brothers he felt that he was in a righteous cause and contending for a worthy end in the battle of pittsburgh landing he was taken prisoner by the very regiment to which he had formerly belonged this sealed his fate on his way to corinth several of his old comrades among them his two brothers attempted to kill him one of them nearly running him through with a bayonet he was however rescued by the guard and brought to camp. Three days after the retreating army had reached Corinth, General Hardy, in whose division was the regiment claiming this man as a deserter, gave orders to have Roland executed. About four o'clock in the afternoon, the same day, some ten thousand Tennessee troops were drawn up in two parallel lines, facing inward, three hundred yards apart. The doomed man, surrounded by the guard, detailed from his own regiment to shoot him, marched with a firm step into the middle of the space between the two lines of troops. Here his grave was already dug, and a black pine coffin lay beside it. No minister of religion offered to direct his thoughts to a gracious saviour. The sentence was read, and he was asked if he had anything to say why it should not be executed. He spoke in a firm, decided tone, in a voice which could be heard by many hundreds, and nearly in the following words. Fellow soldiers, Tennesseans, I was forced into southern service against my will and against my conscience. I told them I would desert the first opportunity I found, and I did it. I was always a Union man and never denied it, and I joined the Union army to do all the damage I could to the Confederates. I believe the Union cause is right and will triumph. They can kill me but once, and I am not afraid to die in a good cause." My only request is that you let my wife and family know that I died in supporting my principles. My brothers there would shoot me if they had a chance, but I forgive them. Now shoot me through the heart, that I may die instantly. After Roland had ceased to speak, he took off hat, coat, and necktie, and laying his hand on his heart, he said, Aim here. The sergeant of the guard advanced to tie his hands and blindfold him. He asked the privilege of standing untied, but the request was not granted. His eyes were bandaged, he knelt upon his coffin, and engaged in prayer for several minutes, and then said he was ready. The lieutenant of the guard then gave the word, fire, and twenty-four muskets were discharged. When the smoke lifted, the body had fallen backward and was still. Several bullets had passed through his head, and some through his heart. His body was tumbled into the rough pine box and was buried by the men who shot him. End quote. Such was the fate of a Tennessee patriot who was not afraid to declare his love for the Union and his faith in its final triumph in the very presence of some of the leading traitors and of thousands of his rebellious countrymen, a moment before sealing his patriotism with his blood. On board of a transport, on the Mississippi River, as we glided toward our destination, I sat quietly listening to the variety of topics which was being discussed around me, until a peculiarly sweet voice caused me to turn and look in the direction from whence it proceeded. Reader, has your heart ever been taken by storm, in consequence of the mere intonations of a voice, ere you beheld the individual who gave them utterance? On this occasion, I turned and saw, quote, 
one of God's images cut in ebony, end quote. Time had wrinkled his face, and the frosts of fourscore winters had whitened his woolly locks, palsied his limbs, and dimmed his vision. He had been a slave all his life, and now, at the eleventh hour, when, quote, the silver cord was almost loosed, and the golden bowl well nigh broken, end quote, he was liberated from bondage, and was rejoicing in freedom from slavery, and in that freedom wherewith Christ makes his children free. By some invisible attraction, a large crowd gathered around this old, decrepit slave, and every eye was fixed upon his sable withered face as he gave a brief and touching history of his slave life. When he was finished, the soldiers eagerly began to ask questions, but suddenly the old colored man turned queerest, and raising himself up and leaning forward toward the crowd, he asked, in a voice strangely thrilling and solemn, are any of you soldiers of the Lord Jesus Christ? One looked at another with evident embarrassment, but at length some one stammered out, We don't know exactly, that is a hard question, uncle. Oh, no, said he, that is not a hard question. If you be soldiers of Christ, you know it, you must know it. De Lord does not do his work so poorly that his people don't know when it's done. Now just let me say a word more. Dear soldiers, before ever you leave this boat, before ever you go into another battle, enlist for Jesus, become soldiers of de blessed Redeemer, and you are safe, safe when de battle rages, safe when de chills of death come, safe when de world's on fire. One of the men, desirous of changing the conversation, said, Uncle, are you blind? He replied, Oh, no, bless de Lord, I am not blind to de tings of de spirit. I see by an eye of faith my blessed Saviour sitting at de right hand of God, and I'll soon see him more clearly, for Jesus loves dis old blind darky, and will soon take him home. Now, when we talk of moral sublimity, we are apt to point to Alexander conquering the world, to Hannibal surmounting the Alps, to Caesar crossing the Rubicon, or to Lawrence wrapping himself in the American flag and crying, don't give up the ship. But in my opinion, here was a specimen of moral sublimity equal to anything that ever graced the pages of history, or was ever exhibited upon a battlefield. A poor old, blind, palsied slave, resting upon the rock of ages, while the waves of affliction dashed like mountains at his feet. Yet, looking up to heaven, and trusting in the great and precious promises, he gave glory to God, and triumphed over pain and disease, rejoicing even in tribulation. While the old slave was talking to the soldiers, a number of young darkies came forward, and when the conversation ceased, they all struck up with the following piece, and sang it with good effect. O oh, praise and tanks, de Lord he come, to set de people free, and massa tink it day ab doom, and we ab jubilee. De Lord dat heap de Red Sea waves, he just as strong as den. He say de word, we last night slaves, today de Lord's free men. Chorus. De yam will grow, de cotton blow, will hab de rice and corn. O oh, never you fear, if never you hear, de driver blow his horn. Ole Massa on his travels gone, he leave de land behind. De Lord's breath blow him further on, like corn shuck in de wind. We own de hoe, we own de plough, we own de hands dat hold. We sell de pig, we sell de cow, but never child be sold. Chorus, de yam will grow, etc. We know de promise never fail, and never lie de word. So like de apostles in de jail, we waited for de Lord, and now he open every door, and throw away de key, he tink we lub him so before, we lub him better free. Chorus, de yam will grow, etc. Then a collection was taken up among the soldiers, and presented to the old blind colored man, who wept with delight as he received it, for said he, quote, I have no home, no money, and no friend, but de Lord Jesus. End, quote. End of chapter twenty six.
Chapter Twenty Seven of Nurse and Spy in the Union Army by Sarah Emma E. Edmonds. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Seven. Our troops at length joined General Grant's army near Vicksburg, where those veterans had been digging and fighting so many weeks. The city of Vicksburg is nestled among numerous terraced hills and would under other circumstances present a magnificent and romantic appearance but i could not at that time realize its beauty for the knowledge of the sufferings and distress of thousands within its walls detracted materially from its outward grandeur the enemy's works had consisted of a series of redoubts extending from haines's bluff to the warrenton road a distance of some ten miles it was a vast plateau upon which a multitude of little hills seemed to have been sown broadcast, giving the enemy a position from which it could sweep every neighboring crest and enfilade every approach. But the rebels had already been driven from this position after a severe struggle. On the 22nd of May, at two o'clock in the morning, heavy guns were opened upon the rebel works, and continued until ten o'clock, when a desperate assault was made by three corps moving simultaneously. After a severe engagement and heavy loss, the flag of the 7th Missouri was planted on one of the rebel parapets, after seven color-bearers had been shot down. After this contest, the rebel general, Pemberton, addressed his men as follows, quote, You have heard that I was incompetent and a traitor, and that it was my intention to sell Vicksburg follow me and you will see the cost at which i will sell vicksburg when the last pound of beef bacon and flour the last grain of corn the last cow and hog horse and dog shall have been consumed and the last man shall have perished in the trenches then and not till then will i sell vicksburg it became evident that the works could not be carried by assault and that nothing but a regular siege could reduce the fortifications. While the siege was in progress, our soldiers endured hardships, privations, and sufferings which words can but inadequately express. Our men were closely packed in the trenches, often in water to the knees, and not daring to lift their heads above the brow of the rifle pits, as the rebel sharpshooters lost no time in saluting every unfortunate head which made its appearance above ground. The sufferings of the wounded were extreme. Those who were wounded during the day in the trenches nearest the city could not be removed until the curtain of night fell upon the scene and screened them from the vigilant eye of the enemy. General Grant steadily approached the doomed city by means of saps and mines and continued to blow up their defenses until it was evident that another day's work would complete the capture of the city such was the position of affairs on the third of july when general pemberton proposed an armistice and capitulation major general bowen of the confederate army was the bearer of a dispatch to general grant under a flag of truce proposing the surrender of the city which was as follows headquarters vicksburg july third eighteen sixty three major general grant commanding the united states forces general I have the honor to propose to you an armistice for blank hours with a view of arranging terms for the capitulation of Vicksburg. To this end, if agreeable to you, I will appoint three commissioners to meet a like number to be named by yourself at such place and hour today as you may find convenient. I make this proposition to save the farther effusion of blood, which must otherwise be shed to a frightful extent, feeling myself fully able to maintain my position for a yet indefinite period. This communication will be handed to you, under flag of truce, by Major General James Bowen. Very respectfully, your obedient servant, J.C. Pemberton. To which General Grant replied, Headquarters, Department of Tennessee, in the field, near Vicksburg, July 3, 1863. Lieutenant General J.C. Pemberton, commanding Confederate forces, etc. General, your note of this date, just received, proposes an armistice of several hours for the purpose of arranging terms of capitulation through commissioners to be appointed, etc. 
the effusion of blood you propose stopping by this course can be ended at any time you may choose by an unconditional surrender of the city and garrison men who have shown so much endurance and courage as those now in vicksburg will always challenge the respect of an adversary and i can assure you will be treated with all the respect due them as prisoners of war i do not favor the proposition of appointing commissioners to arrange terms of capitulation because i have no other terms than those indicated above i am general very respectfully your obedient servant u s grant then the following document was made out by general grant and submitted for acceptance general in conformity with the agreement of this afternoon i will submit the following proposition for the surrender of the city of vicksburg public stores etc on your accepting the terms proposed i will march in one division as a guard and take possession at eight o'clock tomorrow morning as soon as paroles can be made out and signed by the officers and men you will be allowed to march out of our lines the officers taking with them their regimental clothing and staff field and cavalry officers one horse each the rank and file will be allowed all their clothing but no other property if these conditions are accepted any amount of rations you may deem necessary can be taken from the stores you now have and also the necessary cooking utensils for preparing them thirty wagons also counting two two-horse or mule teams as one you will be allowed to transport such articles as cannot be carried along the same conditions will be allowed to all sick and wounded officers and privates as fast as they become able to travel the paroles for these latter must be signed however whilst officers are present authorized to sign the roll of prisoners after some further correspondence on both sides this proposition was accepted and on the fourth of july the federals took possession of the city of vicksburg a paragraph from general grant's official dispatch will best explain the result of his campaign together with the surrender of vicksburg Quote, the defeat of the enemy in five battles outside of vicksburg the occupation of jackson the capital of the state of mississippi and the capture of vicksburg and its garrison and munitions of war a loss to the enemy of thirty-seven thousand prisoners among whom were fifteen general officers at least ten thousand killed and wounded and among the killed generals tracy tilgman and green and hundreds perhaps thousands of stragglers who can never be collected and organized arms and munitions of war for an army of sixty thousand have fallen into our hands besides a large amount of other public property consisting of railroads locomotives cars steamboats cotton etc and much was destroyed to prevent our capturing it End quote. on the thirteenth of july the president sent an autograph letter to general grant of which the following is a copy executive mansion washington july thirteenth eighteen sixty three to major general grant my dear general i do not remember that you and i ever met personally i write this now as a grateful acknowledgment for the most inestimable service you have done the country i wish to say a word further when you first reached the vicinity of vicksburg i thought you should do what you finally did march the troops across the neck run the batteries with the transports and thus go below and i never had any faith except a general hope that you know better than i that the yazoo pass expedition and the like would succeed when you got below and took port gibson grand gulf and vicinity i thought you should go down the river and join banks and when you turned northward east of the big black i feared it was a mistake i now wish to make a personal acknowledgment that you were right and i was wrong yours very truly a lincoln it is stated on good authority that at the time the news of grant's success reached the president there were several gentlemen present some of whom had just been informing mr lincoln that there were great complaints against general grant with regard to his intemperate habits after reading the telegram announcing the fall of vicksburg the president turned to his anxious friends of the temperance question and said so i understand grant drinks whiskey to excess yes was the reply what whiskey does he drink 
What whiskey? doubtfully queried his hearers. Yes, is it bourbon or Monongahela? Why do you ask, Mr. President? Because if it makes him win victories like that at Vicksburg, I will send a demijohn of the same kind to every general in the army. It is also stated on the same authority that General Grant is strictly temperate. His men are almost as much attached to him as are the Army of the Potomac to General McClellan. He is a true soldier and shares all the hardships with his men, sleeping on the ground in the open air and eating hard bread and salt pork with as good a grace as any private soldier. He seldom wears a sword, except when absolutely necessary, and frequently wears a semi-military coat and low-crowned hat. The mistakes which people used to make when coming to headquarters to see the general often reminded me of a genuine anecdote which is told of General Richardson, or Fighting Dick, as we familiarly called him. It occurred when the troops were encamped near Washington, and was as follows. The general was sauntering along toward a fort, which was in the course of erection not far from headquarters, dressed in his usual uniform for fatigue, namely, citizen's pants, undress coat, and an old straw hat which had once been white, but was now two or three shades nearer the general's own complexion. Along came one of those dashing city staff officers, in white gloves, and trimmed off with gold lace to the very extreme of military regulations. He was in search of General Richardson, but did not know him personally. Reining up his horse some little distance from the general, he shouted, "'Hello, old fellow, can you tell me where General Richardson's headquarters are?' The general pointed out the tent to him, and the young officer went dashing along, without ever saying thank you. The general then turned on his heel and went back to his tent, where he found the officer making a fuss because there was no orderly to hold his horse. Turning to General R. as he came up, he said, "'Won't you hold my horse while I find General R?' "'Oh, yes, certainly,' said he. After hitching his horse to a post nearby for that purpose, the general walked into the tent, and, confronting young Papacity, he said in his peculiar twang, "'Well, sir, what will you have?' When the Federal troops marched into Vicksburg, what a heart-sickening sight it presented! The half-famished inhabitants had crawled from their dens and caves in the earth, to find their houses demolished by shell and all their pleasant places laid waste. But the appearance of the soldiers as they came from the entrenchments, covered with mud and bespattered with the blood of their comrades who had been killed or wounded, would have touched a heart of stone. The poor horses and mules, too, were a sad sight, for they had fared even worse than the soldiers, for there was no place of safety for them, not even entrenchments, and they had scarcely anything at all to eat for weeks except mulberry leaves. One man, speaking of the state of affairs in the city during the siege, said, quote, the terror of the women and children, their constant screams and wailings over the dead bodies of their friends, mingled as they were with the shrieks of bursting shell and the pitiful groans of the dying, was enough to appall the stoutest heart. End quote. And others said it was a strange fact that the women could not venture out of their caves a moment without either being killed or wounded, while the men and officers walked or rode about with but little loss of life comparatively. A lady says, quote, Sitting in my cave one evening, I heard the most heart-rending shrieks and groans, and upon making inquiry, I was told that a mother had taken her child into a cave about a hundred yards from us, and having laid it on its little bed, as the poor woman thought, in safety, she took her seat near the entrance of the cave. A mortar shell came rushing through the air and fell upon the cave, and bursting in the ground entered the cave. A fragment of the shell mashed the head of the little sleeper, crushing out the young life, and leaving the distracted mother to pierce the heavens with her cries of agony. End quote. How blightingly the hand of war lay upon that once flourishing city! The closed and desolate houses, the gardens with open gates, and the poor starving mules standing amid the flowers picking off every green leaf to allay their hunger presented a sad picture 
I will give the following quotation as a specimen of cave life in Vicksburg. Quote, I was sitting near the entrance of my cave about five o'clock in the afternoon, when the bombardment commenced more furiously than usual, the shells falling thickly around us, causing vast columns of earth to fly upward, mingled with smoke. As usual, I was uncertain whether to remain within or to run out. As the rocking and trembling of the earth was distinctly felt, and the explosions alarmingly near, I stood within the mouth of the cave ready to make my escape, should one chance to fall above our domicile. In my anxiety I was startled by the shouts of the servants, and a most fearful jar and rocking of the earth, followed by a deafening explosion, such as I never heard before. The cave filled instantly with smoke and dust. I stood there, with a tingling, prickling sensation in my head, hands, and feet, and with confused brain. Yet alive, was the first glad thought that came to me, child, servants, all here and saved. I stepped out and found a group of persons before my cave, looking anxiously for me, and lying all around were freshly torn rose bushes, arbor vitae trees, large clods of earth, splinters, and pieces of plank. A mortar shell had struck the corner of the cave, fortunately so near the brow of the hill that it had gone obliquely into the earth, exploding as it went, breaking large masses from the side of the hill, tearing away the fence, the shrubbery and flowers, sweeping all like an avalanche down near the entrance of my poor refuge. On another occasion I sat reading in safety, I imagined, when the unmistakable whirring of parrot shells told us that the battery we so much dreaded had opened from the entrenchments. I ran to the entrance to call the servants in. Immediately after they entered, a shell struck the earth a few feet from the entrance, burying itself without exploding. A man came in, much frightened, and asked permission to remain until the danger was over. He had been there but a short time, when a parrot shell came whirling in at the entrance, and fell in the center of the cave before us, and lay there, its fuse still smoking. Our eyes were fastened upon that terrible missile of death, as by the fascination of a serpent, while we expected every moment that the terrific explosion would take place. I pressed my child closer to my heart and drew nearer the wall. Our fate seemed certain. Our doom was sealed. Just at this dreadful moment, George, a negro boy, rushed forward, seized the shell, and threw it into the street, then ran swiftly in the opposite direction. Fortunately, the fuse became extinguished, and the shell fell harmless to the ground, and is still looked upon as a monument of terror. End, quote. End of chapter 27section twenty eight of nurse and spy in the union army by sarah emma e edmonds this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty eight it was a proud day for the union army when general u s grant marched his victorious troops into the rebel sebastopol or the western gibraltar as the rebels were pleased to term it the troops marched in triumphantly, the 45th Illinois, the lead miners, leading the van, and as they halted in front of the fine white marble courthouse and flung out the national banner to the breeze and planted the battle-worn flags bearing the dear old stars and stripes, where the palmetto had so recently floated, then went up tremendous shouts of triumphant and enthusiastic cheers, which were caught up and re-echoed by the advancing troops until all was one wild scene of joy, and the devastated city and its miserable inhabitants were forgotten in the triumph of the hour. This excitement proved too much for me, as I had been suffering from fever for several days previous, and had risen from my cot and mounted my horse for the purpose of witnessing the crowning act of the campaign. Now it was over, and I was exhausted and weak as a child. I was urged to go to a hospital, but I refused. Yet at length I was obliged to report myself unfit for duty, but still persisted in sitting up most of the time. Oh, what dreary days and nights I passed in that dilapidated city! A slow fever had fastened itself upon me, 
and in spite of all my fortitude and determination to shake it off, I was each day becoming more surely its victim. I could not bear the shouts of the men, or their songs of triumph which rung out upon every breeze, one of which I can never forget, as I heard it sung until my poor brain was distracted, and in my hours of delirium I kept repeating, Vicksburg is ours, Vicksburg is ours, in a manner more amusing than musical. I will here quote a few verses which I think are the same. Hark, borne upon the southern breeze, as whispers breathed above the trees, or as the swell from off the seas, in summer showers, fall softly on the ears of men, strains sweetly indistinct, and then, hist, listen, catch the sound again, Vicksburg is ours. Or sea waves beating on the shore, above the thunderstorm and tempest o'er, or cataracts in headlong roar, high, high it towers, or all the breastworks and the moats, the starry flag in triumph floats, and heroes thunder from their throats, Vicksburg is ours. Spread all your banners in the sky, the sword of victory gleams on high, our conquering eagles upward fly and kiss the stars. For liberty the gods awake, and hurl the shattered foes a wreck, the northern arms make strong to break the southern bars. All honor to the brave and true, who fought the bloody battles through, and from the ramparts victory drew, where Vicksburg cowers, and o'er the trenches, o'er the slain, through iron hail and leaden rain, still plunging onward, might and main, made Vicksburg ours. I think I realized, in those hours of feverish restlessness and pain, the heart yearnings for the touch of a mother's cool hand upon my brow, which I had so often heard the poor sick and wounded soldiers speak of. Oh, how I longed for one gentle caress from her loving hand! and when I would sometimes fall into quiet slumber, and forget my surroundings, I would often wake up and imagine my mother sat beside me, and would only realize my sad mistake when looking in the direction I supposed her to be, there would be seen some great bearded soldier, wrapped up in an overcoat, smoking his pipe. The following lines in some measure express my spirit longings for the presence of my mother in those nights of torturing fever and days of languor and despondency. Backward, turn backward, O time, in your flight. Make me a child again, just for tonight. Mother, O come from the star-distant shore, take me again to your heart as of yore. Over my slumbers your loving watch keep, Rock me to sleep, mother, rock me to sleep. Backward, flow backward, O tide of the years, I am so weary of toils and of tears, Toil without recompense, tears all in vain, Take them and give me my childhood again. I have grown weary of warfare and strife, Weary of bartering my health and my life, Weary of sowing for others to reap, Rock me to sleep, mother, rock me to sleep. After the fall of Vicksburg, a large proportion of the soldiers in that vicinity, who had fought so bravely, endured so many hardships, and lain in the entrenchments so many weary weeks during the siege, were permitted to visit their homes on furlough. In view of this, General Grant issued a special order forbidding steamboat officers to charge more than five dollars to enlisted men, and seven dollars to officers, as fare between Vicksburg and Cairo. Notwithstanding this order, the captains of steamers were in the habit of charging from fifteen to thirty dollars apiece. On one occasion, one of these steamers had on board an unusually large number of soldiers, said to be over one thousand enlisted men and nearly two hundred and fifty officers, en route for home on leave of absence, and all had paid from twenty to twenty-five dollars each but just as the boat was about to push off from the wharf, an order came from General Grant requiring the money to be refunded to men and officers over and above the stipulated sum mentioned in a previous order, or the captain to have his boat confiscated and submit himself to imprisonment for disobedience of orders. Of course the captain handed over the money, and amid cheers for General Grant, sarcastic smiles, and many amusing and insinuating speeches, and doubtful compliments to the captain, the men pocketed the recovered greenbacks, and went on their way rejoicing. 
when the general was told of the imposition practiced by the boatmen on his soldiers he replied quote, i will teach them if they need the lesson that the men who have periled their lives to open the mississippi for their benefit cannot be imposed upon with impunity End quote. a noble trait in the character of this brave general is that he looks after the welfare of his men as one who has to give an account of his stewardship or of those entrusted to his care i remained in my tent for several days not being able to walk about or scarcely able to sit up i was startled one day from my usual quietude by the bursting of a shell which had lain in front of my tent and from which no danger was apprehended yet it burst at a moment when a number of soldiers were gathered round it and oh what sad havoc it made for those cheerful happy boys of a moment previous two of them were killed instantly and four were wounded seriously and the tent where i lay was cut in several places with fragments of shell the tent poles knocked out of their places and the tent filled with dust and smoke one poor colored boy had one of his hands torn off at the wrist and of all the wounded that i have ever seen i never heard such unearthly yells and unceasing lamentations as that boy poured forth night and day ether and chloroform were alike unavailing in hushing the cries of the poor sufferer at length the voice began to grow weaker and soon afterwards ceased altogether and upon making inquiry i found he had died groaning and crying until his voice was hushed in death the mother and sister of one of the soldiers who was killed by the explosion of the shell arrived a short time after the accident occurred and it was truly a most pitiful sight to see the speechless grief of those stricken ones as they sat beside the senseless clay of that beloved son and brother all my soldierly qualities seemed to have fled and i was again a poor cowardly nervous whining woman and as if to make up for lost time and to give vent to my long pent-up feelings i could do nothing but weep hour after hour until it would seem that my head was literally a fountain of tears and my heart one great burden of sorrow all the horrid scenes that i had witnessed during the past two years seemed now before me with vivid distinctness and i could think of nothing else it was under these circumstances that i made up my mind to leave the army and when once my mind is made up on any subject i am very apt to act at once upon that decision so it was in this case i sent for the surgeon and told him i was not able to remain longer that i would certainly die if i did not leave immediately the good old surgeon concurred in my opinion and made out a certificate of disability and i was forthwith released from further duty as nurse and spy in the federal army the very next day i embarked for cairo and on my arrival there i procured female attire and laid aside for ever perhaps my military uniform but i had become so accustomed to it that i parted with it with much reluctance while in cairo i had the pleasure of seeing the celebrated miss mary safford of whom so much has been said and written one writer gives the following account of her which is correct with regard to personal appearance and i have no doubt is correct throughout Quote, i cannot close this letter without a passing word in regard to one whose name is mentioned by thousands of our soldiers with gratitude and blessing miss mary safford is a resident of this town whose life since the beginning of this war has been devoted to the amelioration of the soldier's lot and his comfort in the hospital she is a young lady petite in figure unpretending but highly cultivated by no means officious and so wholly unconscious of her excellencies and the great work that she is achieving that i fear this public allusion to her may pain her modest nature her sweet young face full of benevolence her pleasant voice and winning manner install her in every one's heart directly and the more one sees of her the more they admire her great soul and noble nature not a day elapses but she is found in the hospitals unless indeed she is absent on an errand of mercy up the tennessee or to the hospitals in kentucky every sick and wounded soldier in cairo knows and loves her 
and, as she enters the ward, every pale face brightens at her approach. As she passes along, she inquires of each one how he has passed the night, if he is well supplied with books and tracts, and if there is anything she can do for him. All tell her their story frankly. The old man old enough to be her father, and the boy in his teens, all confide in her. For one, she must write a letter to his friend at home. She must sit down and read at the cot of another, must procure, if the surgeon will allow it, this or that article of food for a third, must soothe and encourage a fourth who desponds and is ready to give up his hold on life, must pray for a fifth who is afraid to die, and wrestle for him till light shines through the dark valley, and so on, varied as may be the personal or spiritual wants of the sufferers. Surgeons, nurses, medical directors, and many officers are all her true friends, and so judicious and trustworthy is she that the Chicago Sanitary Commission have given her carte blanche to draw on their stores at Cairo for anything she may need in her errands of mercy in the hospitals. She is performing a noble work, and that too in the most quiet and unassuming manner. End quote. From Cairo I went to Washington, where I spent several weeks, until I recovered from my fever and was able to endure the fatigue of traveling. Then after visiting the hospitals once more, and bidding farewell to old scenes and associations, I returned to my friends to recruit my shattered health. End of chapter 28Chapter 29 of Nurse and Spy in the Union Army by Sarah Emma E. Edmonds. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 29. Since I returned to New England, there have been numerous questions asked me with regard to hospitals, camp life, etc., which have not been fully answered in the preceding narrative, and I have thought that perhaps it would not be out of place to devote a chapter to that particular object. One great question is, do the soldiers get the clothing and delicacies which we send them, or is it true that the surgeons, officers, and nurses appropriate them to their own use? In reply to this question, I dare not assert that all the things which are sent to the soldiers are faithfully distributed, and reach the individuals for whom they were intended. But I have no hesitation in saying that I have reason to believe that the cases are very rare where surgeons or nurses tamper with those articles sent for the comfort of the sick and wounded. If the ladies of the soldiers' aid societies and other benevolent organizations could have seen even the quantity which I have seen with my own eyes distributed, and the smile of gratitude with which those supplies are welcomed by the sufferers, they would think that they were amply rewarded for all their labor in preparing them. Just let those benevolent-hearted ladies imagine themselves in my place for a single day, removing blood-clotted and stiffened woolen garments from ghastly wounds, and after applying the sponge and water remedy, replacing those coarse, rough shirts by nice, cool, clean linen ones, then dress the wounds with those soft white bandages and lint, take from the express box sheet after sheet and dainty little pillows with their snowy cases until you have the entire hospital supplied and every cot looking clean and inviting to the weary wounded men then as they are carried and laid upon those comfortable beds you will often see the tears of gratitude gush forth and hear the earnest god bless the benevolent ladies who send us these comforts then, after the washing and clothing process is gone through with, the nice wine or Boston crackers are brought forward, preserved fruits, wines, jellies, etc., and distributed as the different cases may require. I have spent whole days in this blessed employment without realizing weariness or fatigue, so completely absorbed would I become in my work, and so rejoiced in having those comforts provided for our brave, suffering soldiers." Time and again, since I have been engaged in writing this little narrative, I have thrown down my pen, closed my eyes, and lived over again those hours which I spent in ministering to the wants of those noble men, and have longed to go back and engage in the same duties once more. 
I look back now upon my hospital labors as being the most important and interesting in my life's history. The many touching incidents which come to my mind as I recall those thrilling scenes make me feel as if I should never be satisfied until I had recorded them all, so that they might never be forgotten. One occurs to my mind now which I must not omit. Quote, in one of the fierce engagements with the rebels near Mechanicsville, a young lieutenant of a Rhode Island battery had his right foot so shattered by a fragment of shell that on reaching Washington, after one of those horrible ambulance rides and a journey of a week's duration, he was obliged to undergo amputation. He telegraphed home, hundreds of miles away, that all was going on well, and with a soldier's fortitude composed his mind and determined to bear his sufferings alone. Unknown to him, however, his mother, one of those dear reserves of the army, hastened up to join the main force. She reached the city at midnight and hastened to the hospital, but her son being in such a critical condition, the nurses would have kept her from him until morning. One sat by his side, fanning him as he slept, her hand on the feeble, fluctuating pulsations, which foreboded sad results. But what woman's heart could resist the pleading of a mother at such a moment? In the darkness she was finally allowed to glide in and take the nurse's place at his side. She touched his pulse as the nurse had done. Not a word had been spoken, but the sleeping boy opened his eyes and said, "'That feels like my mother's hand. Who is this beside me? It is my mother.' turn up the gas and let me see mother. The two loving faces met in one long, joyful, sobbing embrace, and the fondness pent up in each heart wept forth its own language. The gallant fellow underwent operation after operation, and at last, when death drew near, and he was told by tearful friends that it only remained to make him comfortable, he said he had looked death in the face too many times to be afraid now and died as gallantly as did the men of the Cumberland." End quote. When a hero goes unto his last repose, when earth's trump of fame shall wake him no more, when in the heavenly land another soul doth stand, who perished for a nation ere he reached the shore, whose eyes should sorrow dim, say who should mourn for him? Mourn for the traitor, mourn when honour is forsworn, when the base wretch sells his land for gold, steps up unblushingly, and boasts his perfidy, then, then, O patriots, let your grief be told. But when God's soldier yieldeth up his breath, O mourn ye not for him, it is not death. Another question is frequently asked me. Are not the private soldiers cruelly treated by the officers? I never knew but a very few instances of it and then it was invariably by mean, cowardly officers, who were not fit to be in command of so many mules. I have always noticed that the bravest and best fighting officers are the kindest and most forbearing toward their men. An interesting anecdote is told of the late brave General Sedgwick, which illustrates this fact. Quote, one day, while on a march, one of our best soldiers had fallen exhausted by fatigue and illness, and lay helpless on the road, when an officer came dashing along in evident haste to join his staff in advance. It was pitiable to see the effort the poor boy made to drag his unwilling limbs out of the road. He struggled up only to sink back with a look that asked only the privilege of lying there undisturbed to die. In an instant he found his head pillowed in an arm as gentle as his faraway mother's might have been, and a face bent over him expressive of the deepest pity. It is characteristic of our brave boys that they say but little. The uncomplaining words of the soldier in this instance were few, but understood. The officer raised him up in his arms and placed him in his own saddle, supporting the limp and swaying figure by one firm arm, while with the other he curbed the step of his impatient horse to a gentler pace. For two miles, without a gesture of impatience, he travelled in this tedious way, until he reached an ambulance train and placed the sick man in one of the ambulances. This was our noble Sedgwick, our brave general of the Sixth Corps, 
oppressed with great anxieties and knowing the preciousness of every moment. His men used to say, We all know that great things are to be done, and well done, when we see that earnest figure in his rough blouse hurrying past, and never have we been disappointed in him. He works incessantly, is unostentatious, and when he appears among us, all eyes follow him with outspoken blessings. End quote. I have often been asked, have you ever been on a battlefield before the dead and wounded were removed? How did it appear? Please describe one. I have been on many a battlefield, and have often tried to describe the horrible scenes which I there witnessed, but I have never yet been able to find language to express half the horrors of such sights as I have seen on those terrible fields. The Rev. Mr. Alvord has furnished us with a vivid description of a battlefield, which I will give for the benefit of those who wish a true and horrifying description of those bloody fields. Quote, Today I have witnessed more horrible scenes than ever before since I have been in the army. Hundreds of wounded had lain since the battle, among rebels, intermingled with heaps of slain, hungering, thirsting, and with wounds inflaming and festering. Many had died simply from want of care. Their last battle was fought. Almost every shattered limb required amputation, so putrid had the wounds become. I was angry, I think without sin, at your volunteer surgeons. Those of the army were too few and almost exhausted. But squads of volunteers, as is usual, had come on without instruments, and without sense enough to set themselves at work in any way, and without any idea of dressing small wounds. They wanted to see amputation, and so, while hundreds were crying for help, I found five of these gentlemen sitting at their ease, with legs crossed, waiting for their expected reception by the medical director, who was, of course, up to his elbows in work with saw and amputating knife. I invited them to assist me in my labors among the suffering, but they had not come to nurse, they were surgeons. The disgusting details of the field I need not describe. Over miles of shattered forest and torn earth the dead lie, sometimes in heaps and windrows, I mean literally, friend and foe, black and white, with distorted features, among mangled and dead horses, trampled in mud and thrown in all conceivable sorts of places. You can distinctly hear, over the whole field, the hum and hissing of decomposition. Of course you can imagine shattered muskets, bayonets, cartridge boxes, caps, torn clothing, cannonballs, fragments of shell, broken artillery, etc. I went over it all just before evening, and after a couple of hours turned away in sickening horror from the dreadful sight. I write in the midst of the dead, buried and unburied, in the midst of hospitals full of dying, suffering men, and weary, shattered regiments." End quote. This is a very mild illustration of some battlefields, and yet it presents an awful picture. O oh God, this land grows rich in loyal blood, poured out upon it to its utmost length, the incense of a people's sacrifice, the rested offering of a people's strength. It is the costliest land beneath the sun, tis purchaseless, and scarce a rude, but hath its title written clear, and signed, in some slain hero's consecrated blood. And not a flower that gems its mellowing soil, but thriveth well beneath the holy dew, of tears, that ease a nation's straining heart, when the Lord of battles smites it through and through. Now a word about female nurses who go from the north to take care of the soldiers in hospitals. I have said but little upon this point, but could say much, as I have had ample opportunity for observation. Many of the noble women who have gone from the New England and other loyal states have done, and are still doing, a work which will engrave their names upon the hearts of the soldiers, as the name of Florence Nightingale is engraved upon the hearts of her countrymen. It is a strange fact that the more highly cultivated and refined the ladies are, they make all the better nurses. They are sure to submit to inconvenience and privations with a much better grace than those of the lower classes. 
It is true we have some sentimental young ladies who go down there and expect to find everything in drawing-room style, with nothing to do but sit and fan handsome young moustached heroes in shoulder straps, and read poetry, etc., and on finding the real somewhat different from the ideal, which their ardent imaginations had created, they become homesick at once, and declare that they cannot endure such work as washing private soldiers' dirty faces and combing tangled matted hair, and what is more won't do it. So after making considerable fuss, and trailing round in very long silk skirts for several days, until everybody becomes disgusted, they are politely invited by the surgeon in charge to migrate to some more congenial atmosphere. But the patriotic, whole-souled, educated woman twists up her hair in a cleared-for-action sort of style, rolls up the sleeves of her plain cotton dress, and goes to work washing dirty faces, hands, and feet, as if she knew just what to do and how to do it. And when she gets through with that part of the program, she is just as willing to enter upon some new duty, whether it is writing letters for the boys or reading for them, administering medicine or helping to dress wounds. And everything is done so cheerfully that one would think it was really a pleasure instead of a disagreeable task. But the medical department is unquestionably the greatest institution in the whole army. I will not attempt to answer all the questions I have been asked concerning it, but will say that there are many true stories, and some false ones, circulated with regard to that indispensable fraternity. I think I may freely say that there is a shadow of truth in that old story of whiskey and incompetency, which we have so often heard applied to individuals in the medical department, who are entrusted with the treatment and often the lives of our soldiers. There is a vast difference in surgeons. Some are harsh and cruel, whether it is from habit or insensibility I am not prepared to say, but I know the men would face a rebel battery with less forebodings than they do some of our worthy surgeons. There is a class who seem to act upon the principle of no smart, no cure, if we may be allowed to judge from the manner in which they twitch off bandages and the scientific twists and jerks given to shattered limbs. Others, again, are very gentle and tender with the men, and seem to study how to perform the necessary operations with the least possible pain to the patients. But the young surgeons, fresh from the dissecting room, when operating in conjunction with our old western practitioners, forcibly reminded me of the anecdote of the young collegian teaching his grandmother to suck an egg. We make an incision at the apex and an aperture at the base, then making a vacuum with the tongue and palate, we suffer the contained matter to be protruded into the mouth by atmospheric pressure. "'La, how strange!' said his grandmother. "'In my day we just made a hole in each end, and then sucked it without half that trouble.' I once saw a young surgeon amputate a limb, and I could think of nothing else than of a Kennebec Yankee whom I once saw carve a Thanksgiving turkey. It was his first attempt at carving, and the way in which he disjointed those limbs I shall never forget. End of chapter 29「Chapter 30 of Nurse and Spy in the Union Army by Sarah Emma E. Edmonds. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 30 in looking back over the events of the two years which I spent in the army, I see so much worthy of record I scarcely know where to stop. A most thrilling incident occurs to my mind at this moment in connection with Professor Lowe and his balloon, which I must relate before closing. It took place while McClellan's army was in front of Yorktown. General Fitz John Porter, having been in the habit of making frequent ascensions in company with Professor Lowe, learned to go aloft alone. One morning he stepped into the car and ordered the cable to be let out with all speed. We saw with surprise that the flurried assistants were sending up the great straining canvas with a single rope attached. The enormous bag was only partially inflated, and the loose folds opened and shut with a sharp report like that of a pistol. Noisily, fitfully, the great yellow mass rose toward the sky, the basket rocking like a feather in the breeze. 
Presently a sound came from overhead like the explosion of a shell. The cable had snapped asunder, and the balloon was adrift. All eyes were turned toward the receding car, where General Porter sat in his aerial castle, being borne heavenward as fast as if on eagle wings, without the power either to check or guide his upward flight. The whole army was agitated by this unwanted occurrence, and the rebel army evidently partook in the general excitement. Lowe's voice could be heard above the confusion and tumult shouting to the soaring hero, Open the valve! Climb to the netting and reach the valve rope! The valve! The valve! repeated a multitude of voices, but all in vain, for it was impossible to make him hear. Soon the signal corps began to operate, and at last the general was made to understand by signals when it was impossible to reach him by the human voice. He appeared directly over the edge of the car, and then clambered up the netting and reached for the cord, but he was so far above us then he looked no bigger than a great black spider. It was a weird spectacle, that frail, fading object floating in the azure sky, with the miniature boat swinging silently underneath, looking no bigger than a hummingbird's nest, and a hundred thousand brave hearts beneath beating with the wildest excitement and warmest sympathy, yet powerless to render the least assistance to their exalted brother-in-arms. Had the general been floating down the rapids of Niagara, he could not have been farther from human assistance. We at length saw him descend from the netting and appear over the edge of the basket, and he seemed to be motioning to the breathless crowd below the story of his failure. Soon after the balloon began slowly to descend, and when we next saw him it was with spyglass in hand, reconnoitering the rebel works. Shouts of joy and laughter went up from the long lines of spectators as this cool procedure was observed. For a moment it seemed doubtful in which direction the balloon would float. It faltered like an irresolute being, and at length moved reluctantly toward Fortress Monroe. Bursting cheers, half-uttered, quivered on every lip. All eyes glistened, and many were dim with tears. But the wayward canvas now turned due west, and was blown rapidly toward the Confederate works. Its course was fitfully direct, and the wind seemed to veer often, as if contrary currents, conscious of the opportunity, were struggling for the possession of the daring navigator. The south wind held the mastery for a while, and the balloon passed the federal front amid groans of despair from the soldiers. It kept right on, over sharpshooters, rifle pits, etc., until it stood directly over the rebel fortifications at Yorktown. The cool courage, either of heroism or despair, seemed to seize the general, for turning his tremendous glass upon the ramparts and masked batteries below, he viewed the remote camps, the beleaguered town, the guns of Gloucester Point, and distant Norfolk. Had he been reconnoitering from a secure perch on the top of the moon, he could not have been more vigilant, and the Confederates probably thought this some Yankee device to peer into their sanctum, in spite of ball or shell. None of their large guns could be brought to bear upon the balloon, but there were some discharges of musketry which seemed to have no effect whatever, and finally even these demonstrations ceased. Both armies were gazing aloft in breathless suspense, while the deliberate general continued to spy out the land. Suddenly another change of position, and the aircraft plunged and tacked about, and steered rapidly for the Federal lines again. Making a desperate effort to catch the valve rope, the general at length succeeded, and giving it a jerk, the balloon came suddenly to the ground. Fortunately, however, it struck a tent as it descended, which perhaps saved the general from any serious injuries from the fall. By the time the crowd had reached the spot, Porter had disentangled himself from the folds of oiled canvas, and was ready to greet his anxious friends and amid hearty congratulations and vociferous cheers, he was escorted to his quarters. As this chapter is devoted to incidents in camp, I will try to illustrate the variety of interesting events with which our camps abound. 
after one of the most severe battles ever fought in Virginia, and while our troops were still rejoicing over their victory, a young soldier sought the chaplain for the purpose of religious conversation. Said the chaplain, quote, The tears were in his eyes, and his lips trembled with emotion. I knew that he was in earnest. We knelt down together, and I prayed with him, and he prayed for himself. In this manner we spent several hours, pleading with God in his behalf, until light broke through the darkness, and he arose from his knees praising God. End quote. Wishing to manifest by some outward sign his consecration to God and to his service, he requested the chaplain to baptize him by immersion. The next day being the Sabbath, his request was complied with, in the presence of thousands of his comrades. The scene was a most solemn one, and after the ordinance was administered, there was scarcely a dry eye in the company to which he belonged. In the evening, one of the delegates of the Christian Commission preached to an immense congregation of grim warriors seated on the ground, a little pine grove for a church, the great blue dome of heaven for galleries, and the clear, bright moon for a chandelier. The scene was a magnificent one. A little to the right lay a cloud of white canvas tents shining in the moonlight, and just below, in plain sight, were the transports dotting the water, with their gleaming lights and star-spangled banners floating in the evening breeze, all combined to make the scene beautiful and interesting. The discourse was excellent and well chosen, and the men listened with profound attention, and I have no doubt with much profit. Then was sung, Lord, dismiss us with thy blessing, and the benediction being pronounced, the vast assembly marched to their quarters as solemnly as if going from a funeral. Next came a wedding. Yes, a real wedding in camp. You must know that when military necessity prevents our young heroes from going home to fulfill their engagements to their devoted fair ones, it is the privilege of the waiting damsels, in war times, to remove all unnecessary obstacles, and facilitate matters by declaring themselves in favor of the union, and claiming their lovers on the field. This wedding was a grand affair, and took place in a camp which was very prettily decorated, being picturesquely arranged among pine trees, just the most romantic place imaginable for such an event. A little before noon the guests began to arrive in large numbers. Among them were Generals Hooker, Sickles, Carr, Mott, Hobart, Ward, Revere, Bartlett, Burney, and Barry. The troops, looking their very best, formed a hollow square, in the centre of which a canopy was erected, and an altar formed of drums. As the generals marched into the square, General Hooker leading the van, and grouped themselves on each side of the altar, the bands struck up, hail to the chief, and on the appearance of the bridal party, the wedding march was played. The day was cold and windy, with a few snowflakes interspersed, which made the ladies in attendance look very much like blue noses but the blushing bride bore the cold and the admiring glances of the soldiers like a martyr, and retained her dignity and self-possession throughout the ceremony worthy of a heroine as she was. To add to the dramatic effect of the scene, a line of battle was formed by the remaining troops in that section, a short distance from camp, to repel an expected attack of the enemy. The ceremony having been performed, dinner was announced, and all partook of the good things provided for the occasion. After dinner came numerous toasts, speeches, songs, and music from the bands, and, to close up the day in good style, a regular military ball was held, and fireworks exhibited in the evening. And on the whole, a newspaper correspondent says, quote, it entirely eclipsed an opera at the Academy of Music, end quote. I have before alluded to the vindictive spirit manifested by the women of Virginia toward our soldiers. I will illustrate this fact by an incident which took place in one of the hospitals just after a severe battle. Many wounded soldiers, both Union and Confederate, were brought into the town of Winchester and placed in the churches and courthouse side by side. The ladies, beg pardon ladies, I mean females, 
of that place, brought into the hospital many things to nourish and tempt the appetites of the sufferers, but they gave all these delicacies to the Confederate soldiers. Our men were passed by as unworthy of notice or sympathy. One day a lady, who had been a constant visitor, brought in a supply of fragrant tea. She went from one cot to another of her friends, but had no eye or heart of pity for others. One of our wounded men, who lay near his end, longed for a cup of this tea, as he saw it handed to those around him, and requested the chaplain, who stood by his side, to ask the lady for a little of the tea. He did so in a very polite manner, at the same time telling her how ill the man was, and that it was the soldier himself who wished him to make the request. No, said she, and her face flushed with anger. Not a drop of it. This tea is for all our suffering martyrs. The chaplain replied, Madam, I looked for no other answer. I beg pardon for having seemed for a moment to expect a different one. A few moments afterwards, as the poor disappointed man lay there seeing the delicious tea passed on all sides of him and could not procure a drop of it, an old lame negro woman came limping up the aisle with a large basket on each arm. Coming up to where the chaplain stood, she laid down the baskets and addressed him thus, Massa, I's a slave. My husband and chillin is slaves. Will you set these tings for de poor men? Then taking up a roll of stockings, she said, Dem I knit with my own hands for de soldiers, when I'll sleep in my cabin. We knowed dis war was coming long for you Yankees did. We see it proaching, and we began to prepare for it. Then taking packages of tea, cans of fruit, pears and peaches, lint, linen for bandages, and pocket handkerchiefs, she said, Massa, permit me to give you these for de poor men. I have not stole em. My own hands have earned em over de wash tub. I wish to do something for de Union soldiers, Lord bless em. As she talked, says the chaplain, quote, she grew more earnest, and looking around on the mutilated men, the tears rolled down her black face and fell on her hands as she lifted the treasures out of the baskets and handed them to me. End quote. Our sick men looked with wonder and admiration on the old colored woman and soon a hundred voices cried out, God bless you, Auntie. You are the only white woman we have seen since we came to Winchester. Some people assert that colored people have no souls, which, think you, acted most as if lacking soul, the black or the white woman in the hospital at Winchester. The devotion of the Negro woman, as manifested in the hospital, is a perfect sample of the devotion of the contrabands, male and female, to the Union cause. And now that the time has come when the colored men are permitted, by the laws of the land, to assume the privileges of rational beings, and to go forth as American soldiers to meet their cruel oppressors on the bloody field, there is evidently as great, if not greater, enthusiasm and true patriotism manifested by them, as by any troops in the United States Army. And still further, it has been proved satisfactorily within the last twelve months that the colored troops endure fatigue as cheerfully and fight as well, and get less pay, as many of the white troops. Thank God, this is one great point gained for the poor downtrodden descendants of Africa. I imagine I see them, with their great shiny eyes and grinning faces, as they marched to the field, singing, O oh, we're de bully soldiers of de first of Arkansas, we are fightin' for de union, we are fightin' for de law, we can hit a rebel further dan a white man ever saw, as we go marchin' on. Glory, glory, hallelujah, etc. See dare above de center where de flag is wavin' bright, we are going out of slavery, we are bound for freedom's light. We mean to show Jeff Davis how de Africans can fight. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. As we go marching on. 
And now, what shall I say in conclusion? The war still continues, our soldiers are daily falling in battle, and thousands are languishing in hospitals or in southern prisons. And I, for months past, have not given even a cup of cold water to the sufferers. I am ashamed to acknowledge it. But when I look around and see the streets crowded with strong, healthy young men, who ought to be foremost in the ranks of their country's defenders, I am not only ashamed, but I am indignant. To prove to my friends that I am not ambitious of gaining the reputation of that venerable general, Halleck, whose, quote, pen is mightier than his sword, end quote, I am about to return to the army to offer my services in any capacity which will best promote the interests of the federal cause, no matter how perilous the position may be. And now I lay aside my pen, hoping that, after this cruel war is over, and peace shall once more shed her sweet influence over our land, I may be permitted to resume it again, to record the annihilation of rebellion, and the final triumph of truth, right, and liberty. O Lord of peace, who art Lord of righteousness, constrain the anguished worlds from sin and grief, pierce them with conscience, purge them with redress, and give us peace which is no counterfeit. End of chapter 30 End of Nurse and Spy in the Union Army by Sarah Emma E. Edmonds. Recorded by Tricia G. Thanks for listening.